Hey, it's showtime. Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. Say that fast three times, John. Uh, I'd be fine. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. The topic for this episode is supermarkets of the future. This is the continuation of a series of presentations that has been following the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. And this webinar marks the conclusion of this series with our grand finale. So we might go just a scotch longer than normal. Today, we'll discuss a number of things in this industry, things like CO2, sub and transcritical systems, the use of propane, AWEF. It sounds like something I shouldn't say online. AWEF. Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, it does. but and, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And other interesting supermarket industry trends. You know, we launched the first webinar in the supermarket seminar series way back in the November of 2019. Right. That was around the beginning of the COVID crisis. That's even, a, even before it even. Yeah. A year and a half ago. Now that's changed how we do a lot of things. And some of those things are likely to remain with us. For instance, webinars. Indeed. We think webinars might just be here to stay. Normally, this is where we tell you about the next webinar we're going to do. But with the onset of summer, we're going to take a short break. However, you can rest assured we got Many more great webinars planned and in the works. And we'll be back, I think, maybe. So stay tuned. Notice we got your Mad Max card. Max That's right. Right, card, right, you know? right, right. And we right. don't say anything yeah. about what people do in a pool that they're not supposed to. Notice That's right. that we don't say that. Here are a few instructions. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you can simply dial in with your phone. There should be a number somewhere on the invitation that you originally received for the webinar, but here it is on the slide, just in case you don't have it handy. And as we move along and you have questions, you could type those questions into the Q&A window and we'll probably answer some of those live, but more often than not, we run out of time to answer all the questions during the webinar, but eventually we'll post answers to all the questions online. But you never know, if you hang on, there's a good bet that we may actually answer your question during the course of the webinar itself. And just so you know, this is an answer to one of the questions we're frequently asked. Are you recording it? Can I get it online someplace? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, you can go back and listen to the recorded version. It'll appear on Facebook Live first, and then later we'll post it out on the Sporland YouTube channel. So yeah, we're recording it for posterity's sake. And just so you know, we're always here to assist you with your air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number for Sporland headquarters right here. That's the 1111 number. Uh, you could also call tech support directly at 636-392-3906. And here's tech support's direct email. You can also contact them that way. And we're always available 24-7 on sporland.com, just like just like most uh, oh, all websites. Most sites, there. yeah, not just those sites we're not supposed to visit when we're at work. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen. That's me right here. Of course, this is kind of irrelevant because we are broadcasting video these days. Uh, I'm a senior application engineer. Uh, with me is John Whithouse, our longest running co-host. John is the senior principal engineer for the Sporland Division. In case you don't know, that's John right here. Now let's see right there. So you got red eyes, John. That happened. Yeah, uh, there seems to be a firefly on the screen. Now, John's a published author, a consultant, and as I have said many times, he's an all around extra smart guy. All this means John's a big deal around here, and again, excited to have him today with us. Say hi, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Phyllis is in the room with us. She's our communications director. She tries to keep me under control so I don't say something I shouldn't, and sometimes she's successful. Sometimes. Here's that pesky vapor compression refrigeration cycle again, deployed in the so-called multiplex rack application. This is a version of the system that you might actually see in a supermarket, but is as complicated as it may seem in this diagram, it's indeed an abbreviation of an actual system. I mean, what, John, we've only got one, two, three, four, five. Yep. Evaporator section here. Five. And man, there's how a, many? There's a lot more in a real store. That's right. But even though things get complicated, there's only four major components in the system. The condenser, the evaporator, the compressor, you see over here, 
and whatever the expansion device happens to be. Everything else is optional to an extent. To an extent. But something that's not optional, grocery stores, they're essential. Just think how you would have managed without them over the past year or so. With 50,000 or more existing stores and more being added all the time, opportunities exist for maintenance on older systems, retrofits, and the implementation of new technologies and refrigerants. John, just how long would you expect one of these systems to last? You know, the overall lifetime of a system can be as long as... Uh, can be as long as you know maybe upwards of 30 years out there but um, a lot of systems are uh, only really expected to last anywhere in the range of 10 to 15 years and that's and that's retrofit or remodel time it's retrofit or remodel time yeah well you know opportunities are going to also exist to help reduce losses in product with proper temperature control while, while avoiding equipment malfunctions that might come along with advanced age uh, part of the solution will include the implementation of new refrigerants, uh, remote control and monitoring, and not the least of which might be training. And that list goes on, training like we're doing here right now. Sporland considers supermarkets to be key elements to our business as end users of our products. Now, keep in mind, we're not promoting nor recommending any particular stores, businesses, or OEMs, well, other than our own. And this data is strictly for informational purposes as it appears in this presentation. All I can say is there's a lot of shopping going on. This is true. Now let's take a look at this list. Here are some of the top purveyors of groceries in North America and for the most part, you know, they include Walmart, Amazon, I thought Amazon just sold books. What the heck happened there? Uh, not anymore. They, they've expanded just a bit. The Kroger Company, Walgreens, Costco, CVS, Target, Albertson, Sam's. And I'm going to get in trouble if I try to pronounce number 10. Now, worth mentioning, HEB in Texas is a big player. Very. Now, don't discount Dollar General out in rural, rural America. They are really moving along. Publix and even Loblaws. I said that right up in Canada and and something that really needs to be said Meyer uh, being a, an initial pioneer of the superstore genre yeah yeah very large very high floors you know floor space big stores, stores. big stores but what's all this uh, along the way Amazon has not so recently acquired Whole Foods to make what was already a big operation even bigger even bigger and Ahold Dalhousie, and, I, and I'm sure I've ruined the pronunciation of that name, Merge, that's a, a Dutch grocery retail giant that you might not know exists. And it includes the old Food Lion chain. And then you've got Albertsons and Safeway, they've likewise merged, and that includes the old Tom Thumb, Jewel Osco, Randalls, and others. And Kroger's has picked up Roundies. And that organization also includes Ralph's, Dillon's, King Supers, City Markets, Harris Teeter, and others. Uh, Kroger has collaborated with Walgreens. Now, what does that mean? Well, in certain parts of the country, you can see a Kroger-based grocery second section in a Walgreens store. And likewise, you can see a Walgreens pharmacy and cosmetics in a Kroger store. Who would have ever thought? And for instance, it's not uncommon to see a CVS pharmacy in a Target store. On a local level here around the St. Louis area, not so very long ago, Schnucks Markets bought up a number of Save-A-Lot stores. Right? Did I get that right, yeah. John? Save-A-Lots. Will this trend continue? We'll see. It has continued unabated for the last, uh, you know, almost 20 years now. Yeah. And so I would think it will probably continue. Here's some other things that are going on, some of which impact how we design stores. Online ordering is now a thing. And if you weren't doing it before the crisis hit, you likely are now. So much, in fact, is it a thing that it can sometimes overwhelm the likes of UPS and FedEx for deliveries. Now let's take a look at some of the other items on the list. Not only home delivery can be done, but they, 
they will even take the stuff into your house for you. You just have to give them some access. That might be a one-time access code and even has the availability of a security camera if you wanna make sure they don't go snooping around the place. The grab and go concept not only includes beverages at the front of the store, but sometimes ready to eat meals as well. Well, and this means more remote refrigeration units are going to be needed in the store environment. You can even scan the products with your cell phone, that is if you elect to actually go into the store, and pay on the way out and spend little or no time at checkout. And more and more stores are now equipped with full boat restaurants and even bars. I should go to the grocery store more, more often. Now, what did we used to do with soda bottles when we were kids, John? Do you remember? Well, I'm afraid this dates us a little bit, but uh, I think when we were kids, soda bottles were still returnable for a, uh, for a yeah, refund. Deposit. For a deposit. And That's so right. they cleaned them and they reused them. Mm -hmm. what, a, what a deal. There's something or a business called Loop that is now promoting reusable packaging and product containers mm -hmm. for just that kind of thing. It is definitely a greener way of doing it. And how about C stores with fuel sales in the parking lot of the big megaplexes? Mm -hmm. that Who, that's you see that, and, and something of a reemergence of neighborhood markets. Mm -hmm. So you got the big players coming in and running the little mom and pops out of business, and then they reemerge. That's right. In one way, shape, form, yeah. or another. So uh, I guess everyone does not need a 150,000 square foot grocery store to go in and grab a gallon of milk. Well, unless you need to work out. Unless you need to work out. That yeah. might be a good reason. No longer are lower GWP refrigerants uh, just a suggestion. They're mandate, mandated at this point, yeah. right? And, As, and going to be increasingly so, more so over the next decade. And, and once was the big rage, like we talked about here just a minute ago, the super center, mega center, megaplex, whatever you want to call it, is now giving way to some stores with smaller footprints, that neighborhood market concept. And, and also that might include pickup stations. And with pickup stations, after you order online, uh, you have need for remote refrigeration to keep that product cool before you go to get it. Correct. And more electronics will find their ways in their stores that may very well push designers towards the use of more electronically controlled, electrically actuated expansion devices and other gadgets of that type. And, and just like John, just like you and me, well, me anyway, <laughs> we're getting a little older and some of the old labor force is retiring. Arguably the new group of technicians have less industry experience and that leaves the door open for job opportunities and training, just like we're doing now. And this is certainly not a bad way to make a living. As an example of more legal requirements, consider AWEF. John, maybe you ought to tell us about this. Okay, well, AWEF, even though it uh, sounds a little funny, uh, is the uh, annual walk-in energy factor. Uh, and that is a new energy standard put in place by the U.S. Department of Energy for walk-in coolers and freezers. And so uh, if that unit uh, is uh, 3,000 square feet or less, I think over that is actually... The walk-in cooler the walk -in itself? cooler, yeah. If it's over 3,000 square feet, I think it actually falls under the category of a warehouse facility. Uh, but it must conform to this new energy standard. All right. So it's sort of like an annualized SEER for walk-in coolers it is, and it freezers? Is, it is a form of a SEER, which you know, we're, I think we're all uh, fairly familiar with SEER in the world of air conditioning. And it's sort of an equivalent uh, or a, uh, yeah, an equivalent to SEER, but in the world of walk-in coolers. So it'll apply to new installations or replacements if that installation has an AWEF compliant condensing unit or unit cooler, is that how that would work? Yes, it is. Interesting. So more regulations, I would expect that there will be more regulations on top of this. As time I'm, I'm certain there will be. I'm certain there will be, yeah. Wow. There are even changes amongst the key players on the OEM side of things as well. Here we have listed many of the players in this end of the business, not necessarily all of them. Hussman, Hussman, once a part of Ingersoll Rand, is now owned by Panasonic. Lennox and Heatcraft has sold off 
Kaiser Warren operation. And most of the Tyler operation was sold off by um, uh, to Dover, I believe, and no longer exists under the carrier banner. Correct. You've got Southern Case Arts doing specialty customized equipment and then sources a combination supplier of devices for the market uh, and others. And I believe True Manufacturing remains one of the larger privately held OEMs in the business. And Zero Zone, which we have listed here as well, is, is privately held after a fashion to some degree. And of course, Everyone knows that Sporland bought Parker about 17 years ago. Mm. Oh, wait a minute. Did I get, did I get that wrong? Uh, it might be the other way around. Okay. But, All right. But well, you know, we'll yeah. leave it at that. How will these supermarkets in the future appear? How will they look? What are they going to use for devices, for controls, for refrigerants? Well, we think in efficiency will definitely increase. That's going to be a requirement. I think you won't be able to sell equipment unless you can prove that you're better than you used to be. They're gonna to have to be clean, dry and tight systems. We have to corral that. Yeah. Fewer leaks. Leaks have been a, a, you know, an issue in the supermarket industry for many years and it's getting better, but it's got, it, it still has to get a lot, a lot better. And whether I like it or not, we're gonna see more and more electronics. Certainly are. And look at this, new low GWP refrigerants. Maybe we'll even be using more propane. Uh, you know, as an example, HEB, which we've mentioned, has a store in Austin, Texas, with propane as the primary refrigerant. I might have said propane, but I meant propane. Propane. It, lots of self-contained cases. While there are few instances in that store where the refrigerant charge was in excess of the mandated 150 grams. And John, how much is 150 grams? 150 and grams is about five ounces. It's not much. It's and a very that's small tight. amount. Most of the cases in that store are compliant with that, with that regulation. There are a few exceptions. Right. A few exceptions, but, but for, for the most part, that store is run on uh, a lot of very small systems uh, that might do just one section of a case at a time. Um, but uh, systems that run very well. Uh, I think it's been a very good experience for them, actually. Yeah. Might even be using CO2. Mm -hmm. We used CO2 years ago. We're using CO2 again. Again, yeah. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, still a somewhat limited number of CO2 two stores in the U.S., uh, but it is ubiquitous across Europe and across Canada. There's um, a reason for that. We'll talk exactly. about that reason. Yeah, exactly. Regarding controllers and electronics, you know, we offer a standalone controller to drive an electrically actuated, electronically controlled EPR. Uh, here are some examples of the temperature control and the pressure control out of the Kelvin lineup. And they are also case controls that can operate as standalone devices. More commonly, an EEPR would be controlled by a dedicated board or case control that could communicate with the store's EMS or BAS. That's the energy management system for the, or the building automation system for the whole store. That allows the technician to see and monitor case temperature, valve position, et cetera. It also allows for even more remote monitoring to take place. I, I've said that from a remote location for remote control and that can head off failures and product loss. Absolutely. We've already talked about some standalone devices. Here's an example of, a, of another type of control that can easily interface with that building EMS. And it can control many additional parameters. This is just an example. Now this S3C case control is a device that can control defrost lights, fans, anti-sweats, and interface with the EMS. And we have an online training module for this control with more of that type of thing on the way. And these case controls are typically in communication with the building system, which gives it a lot of flexibility if you are to do that. Now, on to solutions for the problem of global warming. Using glycol as a secondary fluid was one way to reduce the refrigerant charge in a system and help address the GWP concern. 
this particular method was a thing for a while, uh, the so-called secondary glycol system as we've depicted here. Essentially, this is similar to a chiller system and the mechanical refrigeration plant, not shown on the schematic would be off the schematic, is used to cool the glycol water mix that would be circulated through the store. Now, no phase change occurs on the glycol water side of the system. And when the temperature is satisfied, the liquid line solenoid valve here would close and stop flow. But John, something happened here. What, why didn't this keep going? Yeah. Take off. Well, uh, to put it succinctly, uh, everybody, find, I think, finally realized that they can't quite outrun entropy. In other words, um, you have too many uh, potential losses there. Uh, you have to run your uh, chiller temperatures lower than what you would to chill the cases directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have pumping losses. And the colder, uh, the colder you get a glycol solution, the harder it is to pump. Um, you can gain some efficiency back by uh, going to higher, uh, higher glycol temperatures and higher glycol flow rates. Uh, but then what you gain there, uh, you lose with pumping energy. Mm. And so it, it becomes a really, from an energy standpoint, from a functionality standpoint, it's it works. really good. It works. It's it, really it good. helped with the GWP issue. But from an energy standpoint, um, it's not good. All right. It's, and it, at the it time, drawbacks. at the time it was anticipated the government might penalize an owner operator for a carbon footprint excess, but that didn't mm -hmm. materialize at that point. That's true. So the excitement over this system design subsided in favor of other options. We're going to talk about some of those other options. Now let's consider CO2. Carbon dioxide, CO2, or as ASHRAE calls it, R744. R744. Can be used as a system refrigerant while reducing the HFC charge in a supermarket system. Uh, unfortunately, there is a price to pay for this. CO2 refrigerant pressures are significantly higher than other refrigerants. Let's take a look at, at what can be seen on this chart. CO2 operates around 200 PSI for low temp and 400 PSI for medium temp. In a subcritical operation, typically either liquid overfeed or a cascade system would be used. Liquid overfeed would use a pump to circulate liquid CO2 throughout the display cases at the required temperature. And a cascade system would use compressors to produce the desired saturated suction and, re and reject heat to the DX high side rack. Make sense? Let's explore this a little more. Oh gosh, here's a pH diagram for R744 a la CO2. Pull, pulling out the pH diagrams on us again, Jim. What is a pH diagram, John? Uh, that would be pressure versus enthalpy, focusing in on the vapor dome or the saturation dome of the uh, refrigerant, which is where we operate our cycles, obviously. So you're telling me it's a graphical representation of physical and thermodynamic properties generated by the equation of state for the refrigerant. You said that, not me. No. In this diagram, we have superimposed both a transcritical refrigeration cycle and a subcritical refrigeration cycle upon the pH diagram. So what does this mean? Designs typically have two modes of operation, could have transcritical and or subcritical. Now, what is what is the critical point? What does that mean? Uh, the critical point is up at the very top of the dome. Is that it right there? Yep. And basically above that point, you cannot uh, achieve a state of saturation. And for CO2, that critical point is? Uh, 87.9 degrees F. That's kind of low, isn't it? It's kind of low. Uh, by, by comparison, R404A has a critical point of over 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't having a high critical point be a good thing on the selection for a refrigerant? Uh, it actually is a very good thing, yes. Okay, so above this temperature, the refrigerant will not condense when heat is removed. Correct. That means in transcritical mode, the system is operating as a normal DX system using CO through CO2 throughout the system, but above the critical point. Hmm. And it means in subcritical mode, the system design will typically utilize a direct expansion HFC rack to cool the CO2 on the low side of the system. It can. The CO2 will either be pumped or compressed. We'll discuss that in further detail. 
to make sure the CO2 temperatures and pressures remain manageable and operating in the subcritical range during even the highest ambient conditions, the HFC-based equipment is required in order to maintain subcritical operation. Yep. Wow. For a truly subcritical system, that's pretty much what's required. Wow. Or you need to be in a very, very cool climate. Yeah, so where it never gets above 88 degrees. That's right. Like, not around here. <laughs> Safety is a concern with CO2 systems due to this high pressure. If liquid refrigerant is trapped in a heat exchanger and allowed to warm up to even ambient temperatures, the pressure will increase and could cause injury or damage to equipment systems components and humans, cats and dogs alike. Pressure relief valves are typically used to vent CO2 if the pressure rises to dangerous levels. In this example, you see check valves are piped around the ball valves to relieve pressure if refrigerant is trapped, causing the pressure to spike, which could be very bad because you don't want your supermarket to explode. No, we don't want those to explode, huh? This is slide 22. Sporland manufactures a combination ball valve and safety relief valve. I'm avoiding much in the way of commercialization during the course of this, but I thought I would mention this. Notice the orientation of the two valves positioned around the evaporator. I guess they're talking about this right here. Yep. And look at how that valve is positioned and look at how that valve is positioned. So, right. So with those, it would, would not allow liquid refrigerant to be trapped in there and potentially uh, create an overpressure situation. Wow, good deal. Some of the advantages of CO2 liquid overfeed systems are fast pull down and stable temperature control, which is produced by the high heat transfer coefficients of CO2 and have a net flooded evaporator. Since the operation at the display case is kind of an on off by a solenoid valve, this promotes ease of commissioning since only a simple set point is required rather than setting superheat on a lineup of 100 cases with mechanical expansion valves. Correct. I could see that. Correct. There's a lot of flexibility with that liquid overfeed yep. type system. The small pipe diameters are achieved due to the high capacity, which reduces installation time and cost. And everybody knows that CO2 systems are cheaper than regular systems, John, aren't they? Um, Somebody told me they cost four times as much. I don't know if it's- I, I don't think it's cheaper and I don't think it's four times as much. I think it's uh, somewhere in between. Okay. So. Supermarkets typically have, I mean, we're probably not talking about the Megaplex one here, but might have a total HFC refrigerant charge of 2,500, maybe yeah. as high as 3,000 pounds. Yeah, it would not take a, a huge supermarket to have a charge of 2,500 pounds. Yeah. But if you use CO2 to cover some of that ground, you can drastically reduce the HFC charge because it's just going to be confined to that one smaller part of the system. And you could then subsequently have an HFC refrigerant charge of maybe in the range of 600 pounds, 700 pounds. And CO2 is relatively inexpensive, all things considered. Now this is the liquid overfeed secondary system. Now it's considered liquid overfeed because the evaporators are flooded, or if you say it another way, more refrigerant is being delivered to the evaporators here than is actually being evaporated hence the overfeed. Secondary system because the primary refrigerant in the refrigeration plant is not being circulated to the caseload. And what, we'd have CO2 come into the caseload here? Yeah, no, yes, yeah. In an AC, because the primary refrigerant in the refrigeration plant is not being circulated to the caseload. Correct. All right. In an air conditioning system, you could almost say that the air being circulated within the building is a secondary refrigerant of sorts. Maybe if you, want to, really is, yeah. you, know, you want to look at it that way. The systems can be used for both low temperature and medium temperature operation. However, only one CO2 liquid pump station can realistically be used per temperature level. So there's the pump, there's a receiver. And if we start at the upper left side of the schematic, you can see piping with an electrically actuated, electronically controlled expansion valve that controls the superheat of the HFC refrigerant, leaving the cascade evaporator condenser. The liquid receiver is also called a liquid vapor separator since it is designed to ensure only liquid is introduced to the pump to prevent cavitation. So there's that receiver, here's the right. pump. You only want the pump 
uh, to have liquid and you only want the compressor to have vapor. So it's a good idea. Yeah. The liquid is fed from the pump to the display cases with filtration to remove moisture and contaminants. What an idea that would be. We can see some catch-alls being deployed here. The temperature inside of the display cases is controlled by cycling a liquid line solenoid valve and a temperature controller. As heat is transferred in the evaporator of the case, CO2 evaporates to a liquid vapor mix and ultimately returns to the receiver. Note, we've got check valve piped in parallel with the ball valve for safety. Most ball valves will require this to ensure liquid CO2 cannot become trapped during service, except if you use that fancy ball valve check combination that we make. That's right. CO2 vapor is siphoned off the top of the receiver, travels to the cascade evaporator condenser up here, and condenses the CO2 vapor to a liquid. The CO2 liquid returns then to the receiver. And the HFC chiller, if you will, ultimately rejects the transfer heat to the ambient or to some other place. That's kind of complicated. Here is the cascade system superimposed on the pH diagram for CO2. The HFC refrigerant would be used on the high side to ultimately reject heat transferred from the caseload to the ambient or to some other place. That's what's depicted here. In that regard, this system is similar to the previously discussed liquid overfeed secondary application. The CO2 will be expanded and evaporated on the low side to provide the refrigerating effect in order to handle the caseload. It's considered cascade because two or more vapor compression refrigeration cycles are used with different refrigerants while being interconnected with a heat exchanger. We'll show that to you in just a second. The refrigerants are selected to optimize operating efficiency in the respective temperature range. Each part of the cycle produces an effect sequentially lower in temperature in order to span the needed temperature range and ultimately produce the desired operating conditions. Again, the DX high side would utilize an appropriately selected HFC, HFO, inorganic refrigerant like an NH3 or HC refrigerant, and it would have different properties as compared to CO2. From that standpoint, what we've depicted here is not totally technically accurate because Correct. we're showing two refrigeration cycles yep. on one pH diagram. It's, it's diagrammatically correct, but, um, but you cannot technically do that with two different refrigerants on it. So it's just for illustrative purposes only. Yep. So in case someone calls us on that, they yep. would be dead nuts right. But yep. This is subcritical cascade DXCO2. Cascade CO2 systems of this type are typically only applied to low temperature refrigeration. This cycle is comparable to the liquid overfeed schematic in that it uses a DX HFC system to cool the CO2 side. The CO2 side really operates pretty much like that typical DX HFC vapor compression refrigeration system that you know. The receiver feeds liquid to the electrically actuated, electronically controlled expansion valve, which are told what to do by superheat controllers or case controllers. These controllers are either, either control the superheat of the evaporator coil or the discharge air temperature of the display case, or maybe even both. Electrically actuated, electronically controlled valves are typically used on CO2 systems to handle the high required maximum rated pressure of what? 1,000 PSI, give or take? Yeah, a lot of times you're, you're up to, uh, I believe that is, uh, I believe that's about, uh, what, 90 bar? Yeah, I believe so. And and high maximum operating pressure differential. We got a 580 psid that we've yep. got to with. That's right. Operating differential is a, is a big deal on these valves as well. Once the CO2 leaves the evaporator, it is compressed by a bank of compressors on the bottom left of the schematic. You see them right here, which which uh, uh, reject heat to the heat exchanger that is cooled by the DX high side system. That. Look at this as a normal DX system, but instead of having a traditional condenser, it has an intermediate plate heat exchanger referred to as a cascade evaporator condenser, which you see here on the schematic. The combined subcritical CO2 system is commonly used when a supermarket wants to take the use of CO2 one step further. 
The only difference between this and what we have already covered is that, li is that liquid overfeed and cascade are operated from the same platform. The CO2 is pumped both to the liquid overfeed portion and the cascade portion. This being, I presume, the overfeed portion. And there's a pump over here. And this being the cascade portion, we see compressor banks over here. The cascade portion is connected to that compressor banks that lift the pressure to the medium temperature requirement. Uh, note the same operation occurs. This application just optimizes the use of the heat exchangers, receiver, tank, and pump, as far as how many you need in the system to get the job done. Here's the last system we're going to discuss because I'm getting really tired of talking to you. I really am. I'm kidding. This is the transcritical CO2 system. This is the full boat. Remember, at temperatures above 87.9 degrees Fahrenheit, CO2 doesn't like to condense. That's right. All you can do is some form of sensible cooling of the hot gas and no latent heat transfer at this point. The really smart engineers have a fancy name for this process. You know what, you know what it is, John? Yeah, it, they actually call it gas cooling, oh. which is very clever. Yeah, I would have never thought of that. The, the, the same evaporation and compression occur as in a DX operation because in a way it's a DX system. The big difference is instead of condensing superheated gas into a liquid, we are cooling a superheated, supercritical gas into a cooler supercritical gas. And again, it's called gas cooling. And I guess that's what's going on right up here. <coughs> then we expand through the gas cooler valve into the uh, uh, flash tank. And, and, it's, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but when you do that process, that expansion process of that, uh, of that gas that you've cooled, you actually do create some liquid. If you follow that process dropping into the vapor dome, it becomes apparent that you do. Well, it's flash. Yeah. So the flash tank separates the liquid and vapor and sends the liquid to the electrically actuated, electronically controlled expansion valves and routes the gas to the medium temp compression stage. Mm -hmm. How fancy. There are many ways to do this, and we're just showing you an example of one typical way. And we could we could also talk about sublimation and deposition of CO2, but yeah. Maybe we'll save that for another time. I think another time. This schematic may look complex, and seriously, it's a real cluster. Uh, nonetheless, let's take it apart and discuss each subsection. How about we do that? This section should look familiar. This part of the system is very similar to the subcritical CO2 DX operation. Liquid from the liquid vapor separator, got to find it up here, I guess. Yeah, is that it up there? Supply CO2 to the electrically actuated, electronically controlled expansion valves over here. These valves control superheat with either superheat controllers or case controllers. Here you see some controllers depicted. The evaporator pressure is controlled with electrically actuated, electronically controlled evaporator pressure regulators in the same manner. And you see those controllers in these valves over there. This section shows compound compression. Instead of having a heat exchanger, like in the case of cascade CO2 with DX, this version directly feeds the low temperature discharge into the suction of medium temperature compressors. So you've got a bank of compressors here and a bank of compressors up there. Now, keep in mind, only CO2 is being circulated throughout the system. This helps reduce the temperature difference and associated losses found in heat exchangers, like when we talked about that other method of doing things where the heat exchanger killed us. This helps transcritical CO2 systems improve overall system right. efficiency. Right. Through that compression in steps, essentially. Here is the gas cooler configuration or arrangement. The heat reclaim and bypass valves are used to control the heat reclaim process in a similar manner to any HFC DX system. This likewise or otherwise wasted energy could then be used to heat the store or to heat domestic water. The gas cooler simply helps to reject heat to the ambient and that's what we see going on right here. So it's a, a dry cooler of sorts after yes. fashion. This and it's essentially a sensible heat transfer process. The desuperheated gas leaves the gas cooler and expands as it flows through the gas cooler valve. Liquid and vapor are present and click, collect in the flash tank. 
in order to flash tank depicted. And the gas cooler valve regulates gas cooler pressure. Uh, the flash gas bypass valve allows vapor to leave the flash tank and travel to the suction of the medium temperature compression stage. This helps to regulate the flash tank pressure. Downstream of the flash tank, CO2 pressures are subcritical and operate in a similar fashion to any other HFC system. The gas cooler valve controls the gas cooler pressure. The flash tank is designed to separate liquid and vapor CO2. The vapor is then bled to the suction of the medium temp compression stage to maintain that saturated pressure in the flash tank, and so on. Here's a little closer look at the gas cooler valve. The valve is located on the high pressure side. It regulates pressure in the condenser gas cooler, if you will. The CO2 pressure will drop as it flows through the valve. The valve outlet typically is connected to the flash tank receiver at an intermediate pressure. Now here we've got the flash gas bypass valve. Who thought of these names, John, I'll tell you. <laughs> Located on the vapor line leaving the flash tank receiver, it regulates the pressure on the low side and with the flow of saturated CO2 vapor taking place. The valve outlet is connected to the compressor suction line. So CO2, there you have an abbreviated discussion on the application of transcritical CO2. But hey, John, I thought CO2 contributed to global warming. Yeah, but as long as it's contained within the complex system of pipes and gadgets, it's just fine. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have to remember, too, that CO2 has a global warming potential of one. That's how we define global warming potential is that of CO2. Right. Most of the refrigerants that we deal with today, uh, if, if, we're, if they are what we consider a low G GWP refrigerant, mm -hmm. yes. it might be a few to several hundred GWP. Oh, wow. And uh, things like our old friend R404A are really yes. close to 4,000. Oh, gosh. So it's well, much more friendly. From so that, it sounds that like a good point. thing. But how do we keep all that stuff in the pipes with all that high pressure? Well, uh, we've got some clever engineering to make that all work. Well, that's uh, good. It is, uh, it is a, a challenge, but it, it is doable. Yeah, well, well, where do we get all this extra CO2? Do we just suck it out of the air? <laughs> Uh, it can be done that way, uh, but typically, uh, we typically do make new CO2. We make new CO2. Yeah. And, uh, and we talked about this before. Is it cheaper yeah. to operate? Uh, not necessarily cheaper, but it's coming. costs four times as much, doesn't it? Uh, it's coming to parity. It's, okay. it's, 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 it's coming to parity. All right, John, is it, it cheap? There yet. Is it cheaper to build? <laughs> um, no, it costs four times. No, I'm kidding. It does not cost four times as well, much. Well, one it's, thing. It's coming to parity on both operating costs and build costs. Okay, okay. And um, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's getting there. It's not a bad thing. Well, at least it doesn't contribute to global warming. At least as long as it doesn't <laughs> explode. <laughs> Very good. Very now, good. as we go forward, you can expect more alternate refrigerants. Absolutely. Refrigerants that probably haven't even been released to the market yet. You can, say so. you can just count on changes to store specifications on the refrigeration side that are going to come out of the need for increased efficiency, government mandates and the like. You're going to see changes to those regulations. It's just going to be a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see more and more electronics. And from our standpoint, while we might say the supermarkets of the future are coming, I think they're already here. I think so, too. I think so, too. Wow. The time went by fast. Jim, we might we have, do have a couple we, of questions we, do, we can do probably, we, can, probably deal with. Well, if we got just a moment, if you can answer them, all right, go for it. All right. So, uh, first question here, and this is from our friend Anonymous again. Ah, oh, that guy or her or him. Um, I think they're our group, our new groupie. The, the question is um, Does AWEF apply to case lineups and condensing and selections? The answer is AWEF. Uh, does actually not apply to case lineups. That is a separate set of, uh, of DOE energy regulations that apply to cases. Um, but it, it is definitely affected by condensing unit selection for the walk-in. Um, not for the case lineup, but for the walk-in. Right, it, that it, makes it, sense. It is definitely affected by that. Um, so, that's, so that is a, uh, a very important one there. And then another question is, how is Sporland dealing with the upcoming mandate for the use of A2L refrigerants? 
Uh, I would address that by saying that right now, there's really not a mandate to use A2Ls, but there is a mandate for lower GWP refrigerants. Oh, yeah. Many of which are A2L. Absolutely. Um, we are... Uh, What's an uh, example, A2L? An A2L, a good example of an A2L would be something like, if we're talking about the air conditioning side of things, would be R32. Uh, that's one that's already out there in the market in some self-contained equipment. Uh, and there are... Um, Others out there, uh, we have R1234YF. That's one of the okay. HFO refrigerants that's out there. No, no, the question will come up, A2L, and then there's propane. Where does propane fall? Propane is an A3. In other words, the A stands for non-toxic. Three stands for highly flammable. So it's basically a fuel gas, obviously. No. Got any other questions there that we ought to, ought to tackle? No, I just wanted to say that you know we're, we're dealing with uh, you know qualification of new products, um, and uh, are actively involved in all the, the industry research and standards writing that's going on around flammable refrigerants, both A2Ls and A3s. Uh, and so we are preparing both our product line uh, and our, uh, and our uh, you know, regulatory, uh, our standards environment. We're, we're, preparing, okay. we're helping to prepare we're, both of those things for the use of flammable refrigerants. We're doing the preparation so that we can be in there. That's right. To help customers. That's right. And we offer a fair amount of products right now for those for those okay. refrigerants. Again, as a reminder, we're recording this for your future listening and viewing pleasure. Might just be the perfect cure for insomnia as needed. Could be. And to repeat ourselves one more one last time, Sporlin is always here to assist you with your air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number for Sporlin headquarters at 636-239-1111. Uh, that number will get you to customer service or tech support. You can also dial tech support directly at this number on the screen. You can always shoot us a, an email. And of course, we're always here 24-7. Now, here comes the commercial, Sporlin.com, for product literature, virtual engineer. That's Sporlin's product selection program and more. You can, like we said, view an encore performance of this webinar on Facebook or YouTube. And I got to say at this point, John, a big thank you to our internal team. They really make this whole thing work. These webinars, definitely. Phyllis, of course, handles the invitations and sets up the webinars. Jennifer always makes the slides look so very professional. Dennis edits and posts the final product out on social media for you to review again and again. And Brandon, oh gosh, that Brandon guy makes sure that we have a computer and an internet connection that works. That's right. That's very important when you're doing a webinar. Maybe. It's very important, actually. Yeah. And you know what? A big thank you to you, John, for being my co-host for so many of these presentations and putting up with me along the way. I'm happy to do it. Good. This is a team effort. Couldn't do it without them. Remember, we're just taking a short break, but we'll be back. Now, you know, John, I was going to put the Parker CEO's cell phone number up here along with his home address. I'm kind of glad you did. Just so that, you know, that you could reach out if you're a viewer and let him know just how much you like what we've been doing with these webinars along the way. But everybody on the team thought that was a bit much. Yeah, including me. Well, instead, drop Don a note. Don's our current general manager at the Sporland Division. And he'd love to hear from you. Let him know how much you've enjoyed what we've done over the past month. And after that, maybe we'll be back. Maybe we'll, we won't. Or maybe I, not. I told Don I'd be mentioning him during the course of the webinar today, so he won't be surprised. Right. Very good. Very good. This concludes our webinar for today and concludes our series of supermarket seminars. You now have the complete, yes, the complete supermarket seminar available to view online. Thanks for being here with us, and we really mean that. Trust you learned something along the way. And we do hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Well, it might just be you, John. I don't know. Yeah, or just, just you. Uh, or, or not. Who knows?